I am Ryan McKnight, and this is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church going? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason, so if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly... May you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Welcome to episode 64 of the Naked Mormonism podcast. This is the Serial Mormon History podcast. Today is Thursday, August 24th, 2017. My name is Bryce Blankenagle, and thank you for joining me. On this episode, we bid farewell to some prominent members of the Mormon Church, as so many were perishing due to famine and resulting sickness. Joseph Smith Sr., Big Daddy Cheese as we know him, imparts blessings on his wife and children as the darkness begins to close in. After that, we catch up with Bloody Brigham and the Quorum of the Twelve on their incredibly successful mission to England, where Brigham was getting a bit of a feel for what it was like to run his own religion. Later, we'll bring on Ryan McKnight for a Mormon Leaks Minute about church leaks featuring Denver Snuffer and a huge document of sex abuse allegations raised against the church. Today is not really a happy episode. Let's get to it. Let's round up the last episode so we can offer some context for this episode. So for the milk today... We discussed on the last episode a smear campaign that Joe was embarking upon against President Martin Van Buren for his inaction in helping the Mormons. Joe later introduced the idea of baptisms for the dead, and the waters of the Mississippi were continuously troubled from that time forth, with Mormons getting dunked for perished loved ones. We discussed the subtle as well as the overt influences John Bennett was exhibiting on Joe to push the church towards his own personal agenda. Unfortunately, there's no way to gauge just how much Bennett influenced Joe as things near the breaking point of Brokett's expose on Mormonism in 1842. That's enough roundup to milk us out for today. Let's chow down on some meat for our palates. As the scriptures say, they must have milk before meat. The bitter winter of 1839 to 1840 had taken its toll on the Mormons. They'd become religious refugees, and they had to deal with all the pain and suffering included in being a maligned group of society trying to make their way through settling untamed land in frontier America. They had suffered hundreds of losses of dear friends and family from sickness, which stemmed from living out of, like, covered wagons or makeshift lean-tos and the resulting malnourishment from it. Sickness alone had been decimating the Mormon population on a near-weekly basis. All they could focus on was building shelters and scraping by through the harsh Illinois and Iowa winter. No thoughts of homemaking or hobby pursuit were even on the minds of any of the Mormons as even the youngest children were forced into excruciating labor just to keep their family alive. Given such a hard winter into the beginning months of 1840, the saints were fully aware of what could await them in the upcoming winter leading into 1841, even if it were only marginally as harsh as the previous winter. The problem is, Commerce, Illinois, and the surrounding land the Mormons had purchased was still largely untamed, and it was just a recently drained swampland. One summer wasn't enough to prepare the saints to survive another winter. But this was a bit of a trend which had been affecting the majority of Mormons for the past few years. Let's walk the timeline back a little bit here. When they were in Ohio, most of the Mormons were living in homes with like small farms, you know, within a few days journey of uh, the church headquarters in Kirtland. But with the massive debt that Rigdon and Joe had dug themselves into, they were forced to flee in the winter of 1837 to 38. 
They fled with such haste and commanded the same of all faithful Mormons that much of the food and merchandise owned by those fleeing Ohio for Missouri was either sold at rock bottom prices or wholly abandoned, which was only made worse by the rapid inflation which had set the panic of 1837 in motion. The Mormons had one full year to set up and cultivate their strongholds in far west and Adamondium in Missouri. This was just one year. And it was rife with constant chaos and endless work to try and cultivate the untamed land that they were settling there while they were fighting off the anti-Mormon mobocrats while still trying to practice some semblance of their religion under a leadership which was becoming increasingly martial with each passing day. Then comes the winter of 1838-39, to 39, after the Mormons in Missouri had surrendered and were removed from the state which the majority of the Mormons spent that winter in the state slowly migrating towards the Mississippi in Illinois and Iowa. By the time July of 1839 rolled around and the investigative committee appointed by Missouri was supposed to conduct their investigation, there were hardly any Mormons remaining in the state and the government overlooked the entire ordeal. The spring and summer of 1839 was spent erecting small shacks and little cabins to keep some of the Mormons out of the snow. They had to house somewhere around 15,000 people in an area which was otherwise just open fields and small groupings of trees, you know, which were enough to be a nuisance, but they weren't enough to supply the needed lumber to construct sufficient housing. You know, some crops, of course, went into the ground during the summer, though, and if not for those crops going in and being hastily harvested before the first freeze of 1839, it's likely that scores more Mormons would have perished through the winter of 39 to 40. So let's face it, a first year's harvest on a brand new land with new soil and precipitation patterns, those harvests were likely to be much less productive than harvests the, the Mormons had harvested from their well-established farms in Ohio. You know, e each time that they moved, the majority of them were likely to see further reduced returns with each new spring and summer in a new location. And their location had been new every summer for the previous three years. Even if the Mormons were somehow producing a conservative 70% of the crops that they'd been producing while they were in Ohio, they were still soaking up a bunch of converts from all over the globe with false promises of a successful community who were coming to Missouri and Illinois with nothing. There was a resource vacuum, and that's the point I'm making here. By the summer of 1840, the four-year-long self-perpetuating resource vacuum was powerful, and... Unfortunately, the conclusion to any population which is starved for resources is inevitably reduction in said population. When people don't have enough food, they get sick and die. Now, I don't want to dwell on the death and misfortune of the saints, but they were experiencing little else at this time. So we're going to spend the beginning of this episode discussing that. You know, I've really only made passing reference to how many people were perishing under these, you know, strenuous circumstances and the medicinal procedures of Joe, Emma, and other medicine people, which were met with mixed results. Now, I could read names of all of the deceased people, and that would just be the rest of the podcast because the list is extensive. But instead, we're going to spend a little bit of time reading through some of the most prominent names we've been exposed to or connected with at some point throughout the historical timeline and peacefully lay those to rest as most of them were likely haphazardly buried in large grave sites devoted to just the perished Mormons, you know, mass graves because of all of the dead people. You'll find a link to all of these obituary pages from the Times and Seasons Volume 1 hosted on the online BYU library in the show notes if you care to dive deeper into any of these names. Starting with December of 1839, Zina Huntington, that was mother of Joe's soon-to-be wife uh, by the same name. She died at the age of 53. Oren Rockwell, that's the father of Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell. He was one of the first converts to the church. He died at the age of 55. James Mulholland was a member of the 70 who'd been a member of Zion's camp. He died at age 35. Nancy Rigdon, which is Hinchpin Rigdon's mother and the namesake of his daughter, she died at age 80. Now, as we continue to go through these months here, just pay attention to the, the ages of all of these people. 
January of 1840, we have Stephen Shumway, and he's a man who kind of helped in the Ohio legal affairs. He died at age 34. February of 1840, Caroline Rogers. She didn't really have a notable place in our timeline, but she died at an astonishingly youthful age of 22. April of 1840, nearly a whole family was wiped out. John Clark at age 31, Harriet Clark at age 11, and Alpheus Clark age 9. They all died the same month. May of 1840, John Young, father to Brigham, Joseph, Phineas, and all of the Young brothers, who was a Revolutionary War vet, died at age 77, one of the elders of the group. June of 1840, Harriet Pamela Partridge died. She's the daughter of Bishop Edward Partyboy Partridge. You know, he entered our timeline a long time ago. Harriet Pamela died at the age of 19. But to make things even worse for Lydia Partridge, who was Edward Partyboy Partridge's wife, Edward, the party boy partridge himself, died at age 46 as well in June 1840. Of course, since Partridge had been a loved member and, you know, trusted in good standing since he joined the church in late 1830, along with Hinchpin Rigdon when they went out to meet Joe in New York to investigate the Book of Mormon, party boy partridge received a full send off with his obituary, from which these are a couple of extracts. Quote, in recording the death of this, our brother, we record the death of one of our earliest, most faithful and confidential members. His life was one continual exhibition of the sincerity of his religious belief and a perpetual evidence of his confidence in a future state of rewards and punishments, in view of which he always acted. No man had the confidence of the church more than he. His station was highly responsible. Large quantities of property ever entrusted to his care. Deeds and conveyances of land to a large amount were put in his hands for the benefit of the poor and for church purposes, for all of which the directest account was rendered to the fullest satisfaction of all concerned. And after he had distributed a handsome property of his own for the benefit of the poor and being driven from his home, found himself reduced to very limited circumstances. Still, not one cent of public property would he use to indemnify himself or family, but distributed it all for the benefit of the widow, the fatherless, and the afflicted, has deceased, leaving his family in a very ordinary circumstances. A life of greater devotedness to the cause of truth, we presume, was never spent on this earth. His religion was his all. For this he spent his life, and for this he laid it down. He lost his life in consequence of the Missouri persecutions, and he is one of that number whose blood will be required at their hands. As a church, we deplore our loss, but we rejoice in his gain. He rests where persecutors can assail him no more. End quote. Edward Partridge died in June of 1840. Now I moved to September of 1840. Anna P. Johnson, who was the wife of Joel Johnson, who was a later Mormon apologist in Utah and a daughter-in-law to John Johnson, with whom Joe stayed when he first moved to Ohio, uh, she died at the age of 40 years. This is from her obituary, quote, she was a kind and attentive companion and a tender and affectionate mother. She died rejoicing in the hope of a glorious resurrection among the just, end quote. And then we have uh, also in September of 1840, Colonel Seymour Brunson aged 40 years, died. And this is from his obituary, quote, Colonel Brunson was one among the first elders. He has always been a lively stone in the building of God. He was much respected by his friends and acquaintances. He died in the triumphs of faith. In his dying moments, he bore testimony to the gospel and he had embraced by which life and immortality was brought to light. End quote. Now, those were just a few of the obituaries, which led us up to September of 1840. And trust me, I culled a lot of the lesser known names from the list, but the reason we read so many of those was to hopefully gain some level of understanding or sympathy for what the Mormons were suffering through. The sickness was killing indiscriminately, and everybody was a victim. Loved ones were dropping off like flies. Those excerpts lead us to one of the most prominent Mormon losses during 1840, Big Daddy Cheese, Joseph Smith Sr. He provided guidance to young Joe in his occult practices and magician apprenticeship since Joe's youngest days, 
teaching the young boy prophet how to manipulate the world around him with magic spells and incantations, schooling him in the curative properties of plants and roots, and fostering imaginative creativity in the young prophet's mind. Before reading Joseph Smith Sr.'s funeral sermon, let's get an idea for some of the skills he passed to the young boy prophet, both prior to Mormonism and during his days while Big Daddy Cheese or Joseph Sr. was patriarch of the church. This only offers a small window into Joe and Joe Jr.'s relationship. Granted, any relationship between father and son is, you know, inherently complex. So to get a proper feeling from Joe's own autobiographical tendencies in the Book of Mormon, you can see some parallels between Nephi and his father Lehi exhibited between Joe and his father Joe Sr., These excerpts I'm about to pull from early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview show us how much Joe emulated and revered his own visionary father. This is beginning with page 31 and moving through excerpts all the way up to page 313 of D. Michael Quinn's Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview. Quote, In three separate interviews, Orlando's brother Lorenzo Saunders said he observed a folk magic activity of Joseph Smith Sr., Quote, at turkey shoots, Joseph Sr. pretended to enchant their guns so that they could not kill a turkey. Asked, how would he do that? Lorenzo replied, he would blow in the gun and feel around the lock and then tell them it was charmed and they could not kill the turkey. Another quote from later on. Jesse Smith, that's uh, brother to Joseph Sr., condemned the report that his brother, Joseph Sr., had a wand or rod like Janus and Jambres, who withstood Moses in Egypt that he can tell the distance from India to Ethiopia, etc. Another full story, many other things alike ridiculous, end quote. I mean, it just apparently Joseph Sr. using divining rods, uh, your wand or rod of some sort, was able to tell the distance from India to Ethiopia and all kinds of incredibly unknown things. Oh, to be a fly on the wall during some of these things. Continuing on later, quote, Such divining practices were common among individuals, yet a religious group began using forked divining rods for revelatory purposes in Vermont about 1800. This was not far from the Smiths or from William Cowdery, father of future Book of Mormon scribe Oliver Cowdery. At Middletown, Vermont, Nathaniel Wood was instructing his followers that they were descendants of the ancient Jews and lawful inheritors of the whole country. They believed in alchemy and used a cleft stick or rod to discover the hidden treasures of the earth and to receive instructions by a nod of assent from the rods. This included a revelation that they must build a temple. A Vermont newspaper called them a fraternity of rodsmen. The Nathaniel Woods Group's civil prominence, fervor, and open conflict with nonbelievers led to the so-called Wood Scrape a sensational event known far beyond the Cowdery family's residence six miles away. The Wood Group's fraternity of rodsmen boldly prophesied they would inherit that region of the country in an apocalyptic event on January 14, 1802. Tensions built during the weeks before the expected doomsday. Now, quoting from a newspaper, As the 14th of January approached, excitement increased throughout the town, and the militia were required to be in order for service at a moment's warning. So intense were emotions that the militia even fired upon members of the Wood Group that evening and again at midnight. I mean, this is, that was the fraternity of Rodsmen that uh, Joseph Sr. and William Cowdery were likely members of prophesying that they need a temple, that they can find buried treasures, hidden treasures in the the earth, that they were descendants of ancient Jews. All of these things were happening even before Joseph Smith was born. And, you know, we see all of these things enshrined in church doctrine in Joseph Smith's own history here. Continuing from further in D. Michael Quinn's book, Prior to the publication of the Book of Mormon, Joseph Sr. expressed a similar view of the Urim and Thummim, but applied that term to treasure digging. The LDS newspaper published a verbatim transcript of this long interview as a faith-promoting report of the Smith family by a merchant in Palmyra during the 1820s. William Hyde said, now quoting from the interview, quote, I was well acquainted with the elder Smith. He often came to see me, and we had many long talks together. The father told me of the stones his son Joseph had found, and by means of which he could see hidden treasures and many wonderful things, end quote. And now here's an extract from... Uh, Joseph Sr.'s influence during actual Mormonism, quote, In December of 1836, Smith's father gave a patriarchal blessing to newly baptized Lorenzo Snow. 
Thy shadow shall restore the sick. The deceased shall send to thee their aprons and handkerchiefs, and by thy touch their owners may be made whole. The Church's patriarchal blessing provided an LDS theological basis for the use of handkerchiefs for healing by the apostles in England during 1837. Aside from Apostle Wilford Woodruff's healing handkerchief, the younger Joseph Smith gave a blessed handkerchief for healing purposes to Newell Knight and another one to Caroline Skeen Butler in the 1840s. Heber C. Kimball proclaimed, quote, I have known Joseph hundreds of times to send his handkerchief to the sick and they have been healed, end quote. So that's, you know, Joseph Sr.'s own kind of magic beliefs of curative properties of handkerchiefs of holy and medicine men being given to people who are sickly and the handkerchief itself will heal those people. I mean, these, these are, these quotes all help to contextualize the mindset of Joseph Smith senior and the type of mentor that Joseph Smith had in his young days growing up. And now it's come to an end. The funeral for Joseph Sr. was held on September 15th, 1840, for which Elder Robert B. Thompson delivered the funeral sermon. This is from the Dan Vogel History of the Church, Volume 4, page 183. Quote, The occasion which has brought us together this day is one of no ordinary importance, for not only has a single family to mourn and sorrow on account of the death of the individual whose funeral obsequies we this day celebrate but a whole society, yes, thousands, will this day have to say, a father in Israel is gone. The man whom we have been accustomed to look up to as a patriarch, a father and a counselor, is no more an inhabitant of mortality. He has dropped his clay tenement, bid adieu to terrestrial scenes, and his spirit, now free and unencumbered, roams and expatiates in that world where the spirits of just men made perfect dwell, and where pain and sickness, tribulation and death cannot come. But on this occasion, we realize that we have suffered more than an ordinary bereavement, and consequently, we feel the more interested. If ever there was a man who had claims to the affections of the community, it was our beloved but now deceased patriarch Joseph Smith Sr. If ever there was an event calculated to raise the feelings of sorrow in the human breast and cause us to drop the sympathetic tear, it certainly is the present. For truly we can say with the king of Israel, a prince and a great man has fallen in Israel. A man endeared to us by every feeling calculated to entwine around and adhere to the human heart by almost indissoluble bonds. A man faithful to his God and to the church in every situation and under all circumstances through which he was called to pass. The instruction imparted by him will long be remembered by his numerous progeny, who will undoubtedly profit by the same and strive to render themselves worthy of such a sire, and that the whole church will copy his examples, walk in his footsteps, and emulate his faith and virtuous actions, and commend themselves to his God and their God. Although his spirit has taken flight and his remains will soon mingle with their mother earth, yet his memory will long be cherished by all who had the pleasure of his acquaintance and will be fresh and blooming when those of his enemies shall be blotted out from under heaven. May we, beloved friends who survive our venerable patriarch, study to prosecute those things which were so dear to his aged heart and pray that a double portion of his spirit may be bestowed upon us, that we may be the humble instruments in aiding the consummation of the great work which he saw so happily began, that when we have to stand before the bar of Christ, we may, with our departed friend, hear the welcome plaudit, Come up hither, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Amen. End quote. Joseph Smith Sr. was an amazing individual in Mormon history. Now, he was often a beloved member of nearly any society with which he was engaged. He was eccentric, but to that eccentric attitude complemented a loving and folk-wise personality. You know, personally, after learning a fair amount about Joseph Sr. throughout the time that I've been researching Mormon history, 
I picture him as one of those, like, grizzled magic men who could always impart some nugget of wisdom in conversation, you know, even if that wisdom was profoundly absurd or laughable to the person he was giving said wisdom. Even with his intemperance and character flaws, he was a worthy patriarch, not only of the Smith family, but the entire magic-loving Mormon religion for all his days. But I feel like we've only ever seen Big Daddy Cheese at an arm's length for most of our timeline as, you know, kind of a wacky and excitable guy who spent his time intoxicated trying to enchant guns at turkey shoots or, you know, trying to convince the treasure guardian spirits to relinquish their Spanish gold by sticking magic twigs in the ground in the shapes of magic sigils and whatnot. So let's get to know... Joseph Smith Sr. a little bit through the eyes of the one person on earth who knew him more than anybody else. Lucy Mack Smith's biography of Joseph Smith, known as the biographical sketches of Joseph Smith the prophet, recounts the entire scenario as Joseph Sr.'s life was coming to a close with the veil drawing ever nearer. If you're listening to this in the Patreon exclusive feed, you'll hear the entire chapter which talks about this. Otherwise, you're about to listen to a few important excerpts which put a human face on Joseph Smith Sr. This is beginning on page 264 of Lucy Mac Smith's biographical sketches of Joseph Smith. Quote, During Joseph's absence due to the Washington trip, Mr. Smith was at times very weak and coughed dreadfully so that some nights I had to lift him out of bed. On one occasion of this kind, he expressed a fear that he should die with me alone. I told him this would not be the case, for it was impressed upon my mind that when he died, he would have his children around him. This comforted him much, for he was very anxious to live until Joseph should return, that he might bless him again before he should die. Joseph, soon after his arrival, had a house built for us near his own, and one that was more commodious than that which we had previously occupied. When the heat of summer came on, my husband's health began to decline more rapidly than before. This was perhaps caused, in part, by the renewal of the Missouri persecutions, for our sons were now demanded of the authorities of Illinois as fugitives from justice, in consequence of which they were compelled to absent themselves from the city until the writs which were issued for their arrest were returned. About this time, John C. Bennett came into the city and undertook to devise a scheme whereby Joseph and Hiram, besides other brethren who were persecuted in like manner, might remain at home in peace. I do not know what he did. I only know that he seemed to be engaged in the law as well as the gospel. My heart was then too full of anxiety about my husband for me to inquire into matters which I did not understand. However, the result was Joseph returned from Iowa. On the evening of his return, my husband commenced vomiting blood. I sent immediately for Joseph and Hiram, who, as soon as they came, gave him something that alleviated his distress. This was on Saturday night. The next morning, Joseph came in and told his father that he should not be troubled any more for the present with the Missourians, and, said he, I can now stay with you as much as you wish. After which he informed his father that it was then the privilege of the saints to be baptized for the dead. These two facts, Mr. Smith was delighted to hear, and requested that Joseph should be baptized for Alvin immediately, and, as he expected to live but a short time, desired that his children would stay with him as much as they could consistently. End quote. Then, Lucy recounts the deathbed blessings Big Daddy Cheese gave to his loved ones as they attended his bedside prior to his death. After this, he spoke to me again and said, Mother, do you not know? that you are one of the most singular women in the world? No, I replied, I do not. Well, I do, he continued. You have brought up my children for me by the fireside, and when I was gone from home, you comforted them. You have brought up all my children and could always comfort them when I could not. You have often wished that we might both die at the same time, but you must not desire to die when I do. For you must stay to comfort the children when I am gone. So do not mourn, but try to be comforted. Your last days shall be your best. As to being driven, for you shall have more power over your enemies than you have had. Again I say, be comforted. He then paused for some time. 
being exhausted, after which he said in a tone of surprise, I can see and hear as well as I ever could. I see Alvin. I shall live seven or eight minutes. Then, straining himself, he laid his hands together, after which he began to breathe shorter, and, in about eight minutes, his breath stopped, without even a struggle or a sigh, and his spirit took its flight for the regions where the justified ones rest from their labors. He departed so calmly that, for some time, we could not believe but that he would breathe again. End quote. Then on page 270, Lucy concludes her thoughts and feelings about this time when Joe and Hiram were actively running from the law and her other children were all attending about the busy work of day-to-day -day life in the young city of commerce, soon to be designated Nauvoo. She recounts some of her own thoughts. Quote, Catherine did not arrive until the evening of the second day. Still, we were compelled to attend to his obsequies the day after his decease, or run the risk of seeing Joseph and Hiram torn from their father's corpse before it was interred and carried away by their enemies to prison. After we had deposited his last remains in their narrow house, my sons fled from the city, and I returned to my desolate home. And I then thought that the greatest grief which it was possible for me to feel had fallen upon me in the death of my beloved husband. Although that portion of my life which lay before me seemed to be a lonesome, trackless waste, yet I did not think that I could possibly find in traveling over it a sorrow more searching or a calamity more dreadful than the present. End quote. And thus, one small branch of our historical timeline withers and falls among the dross of the Mormon warpath leading towards exaltation. One of Joseph Smith's primary mentors, to which he looked up to his entire upbringing, passed away and left the Smith family mourning in the wake. Joseph Sr. had not only influenced Joe from his earliest days, but he was a steady influence on the Mormon religion for the entire ten years that he'd been an integral piece to the movement. Joseph Sr. was a golden plate witness. He's one of the first to be baptized and confirmed on April 6, 1830, and he always had his fingers in church affairs from that point forward. It's hard to empathize with people from so long ago who suffered through so much in their days. Lucy Mack Smith buried a lot of her children and even her own husband. She was a very strong woman to deal with so much turmoil after rearing such an incredible family, and she would deal with a great many more sorrows from this time forward. In a mere four years' time, she would lose three sons in one month, and the mantle which had been built up for the 14 years prior to that would be snatched away by a beastly, black-hearted, bloody priesthood led by the bloodiest of bloodhounds, Bloody Brigham himself. The 1844 schism was complicated by the fact that Joseph Sr., during this deathbed blessing ceremony, had conferred upon Hiram's head the office of church patriarch, making him like the official second-in-command to Joseph Smith for the remaining four years until Carthage. But Hiram didn't pass that office to anyone before Carthage, so that lineage of patriarch authority was never passed to another through Hiram's hands. It's during this time when all was chaos and people were dying in droves in Illinois and Iowa that Bloody Brigham begins to become quite distinguished in his ability to run a religion. Just as the Whitmers had done in Missouri, running the Mormon religion as almost a separate entity from the church in Ohio, Brigham was running the Mormon religion, with the help of the Quorum of the Twelve, in England. His efforts to paint the religious landscape on the clean slate that was Europe began to manifest as incredible success, sending a nearly constant stream of converts to the blooming city of commerce. But Brigham was building his England Mormon empire much smarter than the Whitmers and Oliver Cowdery had done before. 
He didn't want to be excommunicated at the point of the Danite spears for subverting Joe's authority. So he was very careful in the organization to not step on Joe's toes. So this was a letter that was sent in June of 1842, Joe and the Brethren, about the affairs surrounding the church in England. And this is taken from the Dan Vogel History of the Church, Volume 4, page 113. Quote, Dear Brethren, you no doubt will have the perusal of this letter and minutes of our conference. This will give you an idea of what we are doing in this country. If you see anything in or about the whole affair that is not right, I ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would make known unto us the mind of the Lord and his will concerning us. I believe that I am as willing to do the will of the Lord and take counsel of my brethren and be a servant of the church as I ever was in my life. But I can tell you I would like to be with my old friends. I like new friends, but I cannot part with my old ones for them. And then he finishes up the letter by saying, I request one favor of you. That is a letter from you that I may hear from my old friends. I trust that I will remain your friend through life and in eternity as ever. Signed, Brigham Young. End quote. So Brigham was being a bit more careful about his England Mormonism than the Whitmers and Cowdery were about their Missouri Mormonism. And it goes on in that same uh, page in the history of the church. Bloody Brigham provides a tally of the Mormon converts in England since they had arrived and began proselyting, which had only been going on for a few months. Quote, the following is the aggregate number of churches, official and private members represented at the above conferences held in Preston, England. Elders, 36. Priests, 54. Teachers, 36. Deacons, 11. Members, 1,686. All contained in 34 branches. That's a that's a fairly successful mission troop. If, if in a, if just a few months' time they had uh, cultivated over 1,600 converts, it's really quite impressive. You know, the numbers might be inflated a little bit, but we, we don't need to necessarily dwell on that point. But the next line in this page is just absolutely brilliant, and we need to talk about it for a second. It says, quote, The High Council voted to meet at my office every Saturday at 2 in the afternoon. End quote. Now, Bloody Brigham Young had essentially placed himself as the managing director of church affairs in England, and the apostles would come to him with their problems. He was also kind of the emissary between the leadership in Illinois and the leadership uh, of the Quorum of the Twelve. Now, this was a very subtle shift, but it actually had profound psychological impacts which aren't so easy to quantify. You know, Brigham was slowly setting himself up as the answer man to these 12 apostles who would begin to turn to him more and more as issues would inevitably arise. And they'd go and meet in his office every day for a a safety meeting at two in the afternoon. You know, once such a pattern is in place and the apostles knew that Bloody Brigham could be trusted to solve all of their problems, he would increasingly gain their undying fealty to the Brighamite mantle, which was only in the foundation laying phase at this time. But things weren't exactly perfect for the apostles, though. There were some things out of Brigham's control, like people who had heard of the Mormons and opposed them because they knew that they were, you know, like a new version of Christianity in a land which was reaching critical mass with Christian revivals. Once the apostles got to London, they were met with significantly more opposition to their efforts than they had previously dealt with. This is recounted from Bloody Brigham's writings, and it's included as well in volume four of the Dan Vogel History of the Church. This is on page 175. Quote, This day was the first public preaching of the gospel in the streets of London. Elders Kimball, Woodruff, and George A. Smith, after having spent 10 days visiting the clergymen and preachers and others of several denominations, asking the privilege of preaching in their chapels and being continually refused by them in a contemptuous manner, they determined to preach in the open air, Jonah-like and accordingly went to Smithfield Market, to the spot where John Rogers was burnt at the stake for the purpose of preaching at 10 a.m., where they were notified by the police that the Lord Mayor had issued orders prohibiting street preaching in the city. A Mr. Henry Connor stepped up and said, I will show you a place outside of his jurisdiction, and guided them to Tabernacle Square, where they found an assembly of about 400 people listening to a preacher who was standing on a chair. When he got through, another preacher arose to speak. Elder Kimball stated to the first clergyman, There is a man present from America who would like to preach, which was granted. When Elder George A. Smith delivered a discourse of about 20 minutes on the first principles of the gospel, 
after which Elder Kimball asked the preacher to give out another appointment at the same time for the American elders to preach when he jumped up and said, I have just learned that the gentleman who has addressed you is a latter day saint. I know them. They are a very bad people. They have split up many churches and have done a great deal of hurt. He spoke all manner of evil and gave the Latter-day Saints a very bad character and commanded the people not to hear the elders, as we have got the gospel and can save people without infidelity, socialism, or Latter-day Saints. Elder Kimball asked the privilege of standing on the chair to give out an appointment himself. The preacher said, You shall not do it. You have no right to preach here. Jerked the chair away from him and ran away with it. (laughs) Several of the crowd said, You have just as much right to preach here as he has and give out your appointment. Whereupon Elder Kimball gave out an appointment for 3 o'clock p.m. at which time a large congregation was gathered. End quote. You see, things weren't exactly perfect for the Mormons in England. But they were making significant headway to establishing stakes... On the other side of the pond, an effort which had been met with meager results up to this point. The main point I'm driving at, Bloody Brigham was beginning to get his profit legs during his time in Europe with the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles carrying out every line item of his will. The skills that Bloody Brigham gleaned from this mission experience were invaluable in training that he would need in the very near future which would sustain him for the rest of his life and turn him into one of the wealthiest people in all of 19th century America, resulting in one of the wealthiest religions in the world less than two centuries later. Thank you, Bloody Brigham, you viper in the grass. All right, we're about to jump into a Mormon Leaks Minute, but I want to give a disclaimer before we jump into this, because this is this is a, a bit of a trigger warning, and I understand that these are necessary when there are topics discussed when people have, you know, very profound emotional connections to certain topics. The first 15 minutes that uh, Ryan and I talk is about Denver Snuffer and this this LDS Remnant Church, and that's that's a lot of fun because that's the most recent leaks. But the second half of our conversation talks about child sex abuse in the church, and if that's a topic that triggers you or that you have an issue with, I will say listener discretion advised, and you may want to skip the second half of our conversation. Um, with that being said. I think that this topic is very important to discuss. It's something that not a lot of people like to discuss because it's very disturbing and it's a thing that people like to ignore and hope isn't an actual problem, but it's something that always leaks underneath the surface. And unfortunately, we have seen this recent document dump of uh, this report that – a person put together this 316 pages that somebody put together about child abuse and allegations about child sex abuse of perpetrated by members of the church, usually in leadership positions and what ended up coming of those, those accusations. We don't go into a whole lot of details. We try and spare any of the details for the listeners. You can look at the document yourself. It's in the show notes, but I do want to say that's the disclaimer. This is a bit of a, We don't exactly end on a high note for this Mormon Leaks Minute, so without further ado, here we go. I'm Ryan McKnight, and welcome to the Mormon Leaks Minute. So many answers and assurances can come through daily searching and studying the scriptures and with sincere and pleading prayer, but there are no such promises on the internet. All right, we're back for our third installment of the Mormon Leaks Minute. Ryan, welcome back to the show, man. Hey, Bryce. Good to be with you. Awesome, dude. I, you're joining me from the road, so apologies to any listeners who are uh, bothered by a little bit of different audio quality. But here we are. This is the best we can do for now because this is a pressing Mormon Leaks Minute. We have a lot to talk about today, Ryan. Tell us what is uh, what's newest in the newsroom on MormonLeaks.io for today. Well, today, the day we're recording this on, we, we had a, a new leak. Um, we, we, we leaked three documents, 
um, related to the uh, to followers of the Denver Snuffer movement. And uh, the the summary of all three documents is that they're well, two of them are reports written by a state president to a seventy sort of uh, reporting back on his observations of some snuffer, uh, Denver snuffer followers in his stake. And then another one is a 70 writing uh, to a general authority, an email, you know, asking, uh, basically saying, hey, I was referred to you um, because uh, you've had experience uh, with these snuffer people before. So here's my situation. How should I proceed? This is a 70 asking another 70. And then he attaches, which we've also attached, a letter from a member complaining about some snuffer followers in this member's home ward. This letter was sent, according to the email, was sent to the first presidency, then redirected back to the state president then redirected to this 70 if that that makes sense yeah i find this this document is particularly interesting but we need a little bit of foundation before we discuss these three leaks because for people who have heard the name denver snuffer or who have never heard it it might ring a bell (laughs) it might just be something completely new but denver snuffer has been a little bit of a thorn in the paw of the church for a number of years now. Do you care uh, telling us kind of a li- what you know about Denver Snuffer and uh, what we, yeah. what we can call snufferism or snufferites? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, first of all, it, you probably don't want to call them snufferites. I think they find that quite offensive. Um, <laughs> although, I mean, it's not incorrect. I mean, I, I probably right, use right. that term myself. But they they actually refer to themselves as the remnant or sometimes the LDS remnant. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I mean, Denver, they don't really have a leader per se. It's, it's a very, um, loosely organized group of people. Um, they do have what they call fellowships and you can go online to, if you Google the LDS remnant, I think they have a website where you can find the local remnant, but, or I'm sorry, the local con- uh, fellowship is what they call them locally. And, uh, but again, they, these are very loosely organized groups, um, and right. Denver because, Snuffer, I mean, that, that's one of the main issues that they take with the LDS church is that they are, you know, following a man, whereas Denver Snuffer is like, it's all about Jesus. And all of his followers yeah. are like, it's all about Jesus. But Denver Snuffer is kind of our prophet guy, but we're not He's following like, a man. We're following Jesus. So it's it's a little bit yeah. of fanciful cognitive dissonance in my mind. I, I think they they try to prop him up kind of like the anti-prophet, like he's he's a prophet, but not a prophet. <laughs> You know, oh, okay. um, sure. Uh, Why not? It, it's like, yeah, but um, I mean, he's definitely at a minimum. I think we have to refer to him as the de facto leader, even if he hasn't yeah. been du- duly elected. Um, he is sort of the default go to guy. He's written multiple books. Um, right. And it's it's his books that take people out of the church that the church is having issues with that spawned these three mm-hmm. leaks that we're about to discuss. So, well, yeah, it's the ideas in the books. Um, I mean, yeah. look, he, he originally wrote most of these books or several of them. I don't know how many as an active LDS member. And, and even some of them were sold in Deseret books. Um, <laughs> wow. But I think his, his story kind of veered off from mainstream Mormonism when he wrote a book claiming to have had a personal visitation from Jesus Christ. And when he, huh. when he, when he made that claim, um, that's when I think the hammer came down and he was excommunicated and, um, he sort of shifted over to this idea that, um, that the current Mormon church is in apostasy. So look, th- there's, um, there's, there's no, established tenants within the LDS remnant, although they are trying to set some up. But there's no sort of like, if you want to be a member of the LDS remnant, you have to believe X, Y, and Z. But what they do, they do believe in the Book of Mormon. They believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet. But past that point, there's a wide variety of beliefs. Most of them, I think not all, but the vast majority believe that Joseph Smith did not practice polygamy and that uh, Brigham Young started polygamy and framed Joseph Smith and fabricated all of the current evidence we have that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. The majority you know, of them <laughs> believe that. 
I've heard that cropping up occasionally, and I think um, I try and side with the consensus of historians, both believing and non-believing historians, that think that you know polygamy was definitely prevalent in Joseph Smith's time, and that he was one of the practice practitioners of it. Uh, but I do like I want to kind of draw a circle around what you're saying because. The people who follow this uh, this remnant kind of uh, belief system, or they like what D- Denver Snuffer is writing in his books, I think in the 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 letter that was, or the let's see, what is this one titled? The report from the stake president on the couple of the remnant believers. I think the last couple of lines, he just kind of like describes uh, what he had during the meeting with these people. And he uh, wrote in this quote, she does not want her name removed and does not want to be excommunicated. She wants her family raised in the church. She is worried about that. And I'll read the next one in a second. But the reason why he's saying this is this stake president met with this couple who were following uh, this LDS remnant and following Denver Snuffer's beliefs and trying to pass out Snuffer's books to other Mormons. And they thought that that was necessary of a disciplinary council. And she doesn't want that, you know, the couple of, they didn't want that to happen. And then the, the report ends with this quote, she does not feel there's anything wrong with what they were doing, such as baptism, because they were rebaptized. She is very content with it. She's been fasting and praying to know if she's doing something wrong. Nothing is indicating to her that she is going down the wrong path. So it it's like, let let me say something about that real quick. Okay. Um, Because I I do have, you know, some experience with these this group of people i'm i'm in their private facebook group that they have which is very active um okay. and today it was it was a very active group because of my leak but it's always active um and, and i read a lot of what these guys write you know boots on the ground if you will um i don't i'm gonna go out on a limb i, I could be wrong but just based on on the people who i've read their writings that are in this group um, she either is new to the movement and is not a full believer in the remnant movement and is just sort of tasting the waters or she's outright lying because if you're, if you, if you fully converted to the snuffer way of thinking, um, I've never seen any of them that have any kind of loyalty to the mainstream church. And if anything, they, they revel in the fact that they've been excommunicated, the ones that have been. Um, mm-hmm. and they, and they show that almost as a badge of courage and, and, and some of them do go to church, but they, in no way, I, I, the ones that I interact with, I can't s- imagine any of them saying something like, well, it's important for my kids to be raised in the mainstream Mormon church, or I want my name still on the record. So, so I'm thinking she's either in a transition period where she's not a hundred percent in, or she's being deceptive. Interesting. And it could be something – I think it's probably the former more than the latter because, I mean, this this president – stake president was meeting with this couple. It sounds like when they just started you know, learning about snufferism and learning about this remnant church and it sounds like she was kind of early on in her path. Of course, all the names are redacted and everything, so there's no way to reach out to these people, which is good because – I don't think that they should be, uh, you know, essentially doxxed in a situation like this uh, when people are so readily available on Facebook and whatnot. But it does go to show that the the church is obviously kind of feeling the pinch with uh, snufferism, with people who are, uh, well, are, are converting to this or are starting to follow the snufferite kind of ideals. And I find that fascinating. I have sources telling me um – including the source that provided these particular documents. Um, and, and if you go to the to the leak today, you'll see that there's a landing page for Denver Snuffer, and we have a yeah. couple of other leaks in the past related to him and his people. Um, but my sources tell me that um, that he is a frequent cop topic of conversation uh, within the leadership in, the ter- in terms of uh, reports and emails and, you know, how are we dealing with this situation and whatnot. Um, these are not isolated incidences. Um, there's, there are many of them and they're only growing by the day. You know, this is a baffling concept to me because the, the majority of people that leave the LDS church aren't leaving for snufferism. They're leaving for no religion. So it's like the church is taking notice and trying to mitigate the damage that's being done by this, this, you know, small remnant church and, you know, actively excommunicating people for apostasy because they're following this when well, at the I same time people are leaving by the thousands 
to yeah. just leave the religion completely. It's like they're trying to say, oh, I got to get this rock out of my shoe. Well, you have arterial bleeding because your arm is cut off. Yeah, but the rock is really uncomfortable. Like they're it seems like they're attacking the wrong problem when they're trying to go after people who are following this. I'm going to I'm going to disagree with you. I, I actually think I, I know why they're so fixated on the snuffer move, the remnant movement. And, and it's because it's for a couple of reasons. Number one, if let, let's just take somebody, you know, I'll use myself as an example. I, I don't re- necessarily represent all of the ex-Mormons that you just described, but I definitely fall within the group of ex-Mormons that you described that are sort of running away from religion and and pointing to the outright falsity of it all. Um, the 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 people in in my category, right? There's really nothing that they can say or do to satisfy the 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 questions and the concerns um, because most of the time their their apologetics sort of fly in the face of logic and reason and what have you but of course but with with people that are on the snuffer side of the spectrum there, there's a couple of things going on N- number one they tend to be very conservative of politics okay um, and they and that is is reflected in a lot of their beliefs and thinkings and in fact one of their one of the biggest proofs that they use that many of them will use as 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 proof that the current mormon church has uh gone into apostasy is that it's become too liberal okay they will they will point to to instances where the church has accepted this or accepted that which in their mind is is too liberal so one of the things is one point is that their teachings are a lot more attractive to their base than what mine are, because even though I wouldn't consider myself a super liberal guy, compared to the average Mormon, I, I'm a flaming progressive. And so, uh, a, your typical Mormon is less likely to listen to me or turn me off just simply because of that, because they associate hmm. me with a political movement that is sort of evil and rooted in Satan. But the snuffer people are not on that spectrum of politics. And so they're, it's more easy for them to sort of be relatable. The other thing is, is that they believe in Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon, and many of them will say specifically that they've prayed, they've received an answer from the Holy Ghost that Joseph Smith is a prophet, that the Book of Mormon is true, and that Thomas Monson is not a prophet. And they appeal yeah. sort of Holy Ghost, and they and they can do it using Mormon language. So when you combine the fact that they still believe in the basics of Mormonism, and they're on the same political spectrum as your average uh, Mormon in Utah, I think they pose, in some ways, a bigger threat than somebody like myself who is going to just sort of reject the whole thing outright. That's that's an interesting take, and you know, thinking about it a little bit, I I agree with you. That that does make sense. It's. It's more of a threat when it's a wolf in sheep's clothing as opposed to just a wolf that's on the other side of the fence growling, right? And, yeah, it's really easy yeah. for the Deseret News to write an article and demonize Ryan McKnight, the founder of, Wik- of Mormon Leaks, who wants to supposedly tear down the church. But it's it's a lot harder to say, oh, you know, here's Sally from the ward who loves the Book of Mormon, you know, <laughs> but yeah. but she's on apostate. It's 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 a tough one to. To to, to 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 a tough line to toe, and I, yeah, I, yeah. So that that's kind of why I think they see it as such a big threat. And it it makes me wonder why they would um, be actively excommunicating more of these people than they would be uh, people who are falling away. You know, the majority of ex Mormons have to send in their letters to to get their name taken off of the records. But whereas, again, like again, that these... that, be, that comes to the idea that. Most ex-Mormons that leave religion, they they don't go to church anymore, so they're not right there. I mean, they might be doing stuff on social media, but probably not right, even that. Right. They're not there. But these people are leaving Mormonism, but they're still there. Yeah, so they've got that, to kick them out. <laughs> they've got to do something to kick them out. Yeah, they still believe in all of it. They're still yeah completely on board with Joseph Smith as a prophet in the Book of Mormon. And, and some of them are uh, still going yeah. to church. Some of them are still well, going and to they, they do claim pretty vehemently that the keys were ordained on Hiram Smith and they were lost essentially when Joseph and Hiram died in Carthage, right? So the keys were never transferred to the Quorum of the Twelve. Therefore, they do not have any divine claim to the keys of the priesthood and that those those are just kind of with Jesus and whoever claims that they have the divine priesthood, they, they have it or something to that effect. That's probably a vast overgeneralization. Yeah. But I mean that does pose a threat to the authority claims 
Yeah, I mean that is definitely one of the themes you'll see. But but again, let's not let's. I want your listeners to remember that there is no uniform belief, and so you will find people in the remnant movement that do not agree with what you just said. They, oh, but, interesting. Yeah, I mean there is such a vast spectrum of what they believe and what they don't believe. But what they what they definitely all agree on is that the current church is an apostasy. Now, where that apostasy occurred, I think there's probably some discussion to be had. I. <laughs> I, I don't know if the major, I don't, I don't know if the majority believe in that Hiram Smith line that you just said. I know a lot of them do. I don't know if that's the majority or not. Um, uh, but, mm-hmm. but yeah, it is important to not forget that there is no cohesion when it comes to the sort of the basic tenets of, of, of the remnant. That's fair. Uh, that, that, that is fairly interesting. Of course, there is a fair amount out there online about Denver Snuffer. He's been making waves, you know, ever since about 2013 when he was excommunicated and a little before then when he was publishing his books prior to his excommunication. And, you know, now there's, the, of course, the LDS remnant. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there's a Radio West interview uh, yes. about Denver Snuffer that I think it was Lindsey Hansen Park did. Is that right? Yes, and it's I, anybody that wants to learn more about this movement, that is probably the best place to start. She just gave the interview on uh, August 1st, I believe it was, and it was coming off the hills of Denver Snuffer speaking at Sunstone, and she actually was able to spend some one-on-one time with him, and she's interacted with a lot of their followers, and she brings some of that sort of inside knowledge, if you will, to the interview. Um, not inside in the sense that she's not a follower of the remnant, um, but she is definitely, uh, she definitely has a, a very close perspective. And it's, it's, it's the interviews less than an hour and it's, it's, it's an hour very well spent, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, definitely agree. So there will be a link to the radio uh, interview that we're talking about. It was by Doug Fabrizio. Um, published on August 1st, and it's titled Denver Snuffer and the Remnant Movement. So be sure to check the show notes for that. Now, of course, Ryan, we have another leak that I need to get or that we really need to discuss. And this wasn't necessarily a leak per se. It was kind of a special case. Can we talk a little bit about this that came out, uh, I believe, was a week and a half ago? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I would like to address is what you you just touched on uh, and the fact that this was not a leak. Um, and we tried to frame it, the publishing of it in, in a way that made that clear. And, um, you know, a lot of people contacted me, uh, privately and through comments on social media asking why it was not the headline of the week because it was clearly more interesting than the other documents we released. Um, and, and just to sort of answer those questions that people had, uh, in regards to that, um, you know, this is a compilation of information that already existed in the public square, but you would have to go one by one searching for these things to find them. So they're not, this is sort of, as far as I know, the first time they've all been put into one place. Um, and so that was the value that we saw in the document as far as us publishing it and promoting awareness and and uh, transparency and things of this nature. Um, but but we did not want to headline it because we didn't want people to think it was a leak and then open it up, realize it wasn't a leak, and then sort of say that we were trying to be deceptive and trying to get clicks and clickbait and all that kind of stuff. So we wanted it to go viral, but we wanted it to happen organically if it was going to happen at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it has gotten a lot of attention on its own. Um uh, this is the second interview where I've been asked about, uh, the, the document. Um, I've had a lot of, there's been a lot of activity on social media about the document. So, um, I do think it's gotten its, um, its due. Basically what the document is, is there's a lady, her name is, uh, Deb, uh, I don't know how you pronounce her last name. It's Diner or Diener. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Um, but she contacted me several months ago. I think I'm going to guess in March, although I don't, remember the exact day she contacted me, but it's been several months. Um, and she contacted me and let me know about the, these files that she had been investigating since uh, around 2010. I believe I don't recall exactly when she started doing this. Um, but she's had this exhaustive, uh, you know, effort that she's been going through and she wanted me, uh, she wanted our website to sort of bring attention to these files and publish them. Um, and initially we were going to, she sent me all of like 400 files, whatever it is. And we were going to create a wiki page for each case 
which some cases have one file, some have two or three attached to them. And we were going to create a wiki page for each page, page uh, for each case, I should say. Um, but that you can imagine, yeah, you just said, wow. I mean, you that's, can imagine. Yeah, that's that. a lot of work. And, and we're not a, you know, it, I'm basically, a, a, we're a two man band here at Mormon Leak. So luckily though, um, you know, she had this database that she'd been compiling and she, initially she didn't think she could publish it because, um, she has some legal limitations. I'm not exactly sure what they all are. Uh, but she has legal limitations on how much she can talk about these things. Um, because of how sex abuse has touched her family and, um, but she, well, and just the, the inherently controversial nature of sex abuse, especially when it comes to a massive organized religion true. this way, I can understand that, uh, the need for dis, uh, you know, sort of <laughs> discreet type of, uh, release is probably a good idea and trying to yeah. keep, you know, protect individuals as much as possible is probably the best way to approach this. Yeah. And she, she was able to get permission from her attorney, um, to publish this, um, report she prepared with her name on it. Um, we initially thought she would not be able to because of her legal restraints, but she was, she can't really, uh, you know, give interviews or anything like that, unfortunately. Um, but you know, she is an advocate for victims of sex abuse. Um, she runs a support group. Uh, she doesn't live in Utah, but the state that she does live in, um, she's a huge advocate and she's actually, uh, helped lobby for some changes in the, the laws in her state regarding sex abuse. She's spoken before the legislature in her state. Um, she's really done some great advocacy behind the scenes. And, um, really the purpose of this document is, is not to say, oh, look, the church is covering up sex abuse or, uh, or anything like that, because I don't, don't think that that's what the documents show. Um, I think what the purpose is. That. Okay, yeah, I, th it's open for debate, um, yeah. but that's not what we were trying to show. Um, if if that's ultimately what the documents show after a, a thorough analysis, then so be it. Um, but what we were really just trying to do was to show that um, when when you hear about sex abuse um, it, within the Mormon Church, it's not an isolated incident, and far from that. Um, it's something that's yeah. constantly going on. They are constantly settling these cases for millions and millions and r ultimately hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and people have a right to know, uh, that that's, that that's going on. So, I mean, that, that's really what it's all about is the awareness that it builds. So let me talk about this for just a second and, and let me try and elucidate my argument why I think that this does, um, illustrate that the church has been actively covering these things up or not. Okay. So covering something up runs a, a wide spectrum of inaction to deliberate action to cover something up. Right. And I think inaction in any of these cases can be considered on that spectrum of covering something up. Uh, but maybe not as actively as like shuffling these people around as is, you know, frequently done by, let's say, the Catholic Church or something. But let me read just a little bit from the introduction of what, uh, Deborah Diner here compiled because I think this is the very important takeaways from this document. And it says child abuse has dramatically, or sorry, child abuse dramatically increases the risk of seven out of 10 of the leading causes of death, decreasing life expectancy by 20 years. And this damage is passed genetically generation after generation. The lifelong health effects of child abuse include, and here she lists a bunch of the, uh, the, Correlate the corollaries that they found with uh, child abuse, and that includes brain atrophy, suicide risk in girls two to four times or boys four to 12 times the risk, psychological problems including anorexia, bulimia, PTSD, high risk behaviors such as drug and alcohol abuse, promiscuity and exploitation, teen pregnancies, COPD is two and a half times higher, hepatitis is two and a half times the risk, uh, depression is four to five times the risk, lung cancer has a 33% higher risk, um, ADHD and self-harm and it says there is she includes a couple of stats here that are very important child predators on average will abuse 175 children in their lifetime some have admitted to over 1,000 children researchers at harvard have determined that there is no cure for pedophilia therefore the focus should be on protecting our children and i want to talk about that in a second she includes a couple of other stats. A child predator will abuse 50 to 75 children before he is caught, but only 3% of predators are apprehended. According to experts, 86% of child abuse is never reported and is a worldwide epidemic with over 40 million survivors. 
So, and of course, there are citations for that. Um, mm-hmm. And it, the last thing that it says, which I think is just a very, you know, ancillary point, it costs our country billions of dollars every year. But there's citations for all of that. And this is a, obviously a far reaching problem that needs to be further discussed. But my point is, uh, there is no cure for pedophilia. And if you have any sort of orchestra, uh, you know, organized uh, sort of system, inevitably, this is going to be a topic that comes up. And the point that it makes in the very first thing here is, therefore, the focus should be on protecting our children. Now, when we have so many cases of people who were accused of men who were accused of child abuse, and then they moved somewhere else, and they were immediately put into a leadership position over scouting, over the, uh, the you know, the lo- younger generation in the church, over primary schools, over any of these these places where children are made vulnerable to them. That is actively not – or that is actively covering something up or ignoring it. The point I'm trying to make is when you have a system that does allow people to move from one place to another and children are not protected because of the inaction of somebody in a leadership position or people – or you know children are put directly in harm's way because of oversight from uh, somebody in a higher position – I think that actively contributes to more children being sexually abused. And I think on the spectrum, that shows that the church at some level is protecting sex abusers at a very systematic level. And these documents go from the mid-60s all the way up to 2017. And the most disturbing part that I saw was the posts on the ex-Mormon Reddit in response to this saying – What's most fucked up about this is I didn't see the name of my bishop on there, and I know that he abused me and my my brother. Like, yeah. I, there there are a lot of people that slip through the cracks. This is by no means a comprehensive list, and it's Absolutely. over three hundred pages of this. That and, that is uh, you know, appalling. I, I don't want to completely interrupt you there, but just you know, you pick pick on something uh, important there about it not being a comprehensive list. Um, people who go to go to our our new our uh, wiki page for this document, which I'm sure will be in the show notes, um, the there is so, uh, an email address in there because the lady Deb who compiled this, she wants this to be a living document, and she wants people to send her anything uh, you know for of additional cases that she's missed, and she wants to add to it. And and if, every time she adds like ten cases, you know we'll upload the most latest document. Um, but you know it needs to be something that's been sort of documented either with co- uh, public court papers or newspaper articles, things like that. I mean, uh, she's not really looking to add just people's sort of personal stories to the list. Um, this is more for ones that are documented cases. Um, but yeah, another point that you touched on is you know she cites the stat of what was the number eighty something percent that go unreported? Yep. Um, you know, and here you've got you know a cu- couple hundred pages worth. So you know, what's the real number? I mean, these are scary things to think about. Um, yeah, and I think and if if you want this the gravity of this document to hit you, all you have to do is scroll through it. Just scroll yeah. through and keep your eye on the bolded text on the left side. We got Idaho, Oregon, Palm Springs, California, Idaho again, Oregon again, Utah, Utah, Los Angeles, California, Maui, Hawaii, Columbia, South Carolina, California again, Glasgow, Sky- Scotland, Georgia, Utah, 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 Idaho, Utah, Utah. I mean, it it is everywhere. And, and, you know, a lot of, some of them are only supported with newspaper articles, but a many number of them have actual internal documents or court documents that, that were available. Uh, a lot of the Boy Scout ones have internal memos from the Boy Scouts where the abuse is discussed and, and you can see that, you know, proper actions were not being made, you know, as evident, as evidenced by their own internal memos. Um, so yeah, it, it's a fascinating document, and uh, people, if they, if people who are listening to this have anything to add to it, they should uh, not hesitate to send that in to us well, uh, or to Deb directly. I think that this, what we're talking about right now, yes, Mormon leaks can be the avenue that commits the church to more transparency, and I think that is an, a necessary goal and in part of the mission statement of Mormon leaks. But this is something that needs to be handled at the internal level on, by the Mormon church because this is yeah. absolutely abhorrent 
what is happening. Yeah. And let's just say right now how the system is set up is vastly un un fixed it's completely yeah. destroyed it's broken what they do when they get a response to this or they they receive a complaint that something like this has happened or any sort of weird things have been going on with any leader they bring them in and talk to them specifically or they bring the child in and talk to them specifically and then they have a hotline set up which may or may not be used which just goes to the church headquarters bishops are not mandatory reporters there's nobody in the chain of command who is set out as a mandatory reporter unless their day-to-day -day job is like a teacher or a counselor or somebody that is that happens to be a mandatory reporter so everything that happens in this system the safety net is set up to protect the church instead of these kids that is the problem right that is what we need to focus on as the the issue at hand the, the fact that yeah. we have an internal organization with rife complaints of child sex abuse policing itself on this issue with a hotline that only goes to its own internal leadership i think that is criminal salacious and absolutely disturbing listen the the, the leaders have told us uh, on various occasions especially as of late that 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 the leaders are all fallible um, that none of none of them are perfect, and since they've acknowledged that little bit, uh, they have to also acknowledge that they are, in their imperfection, capable of heinous acts, uh, just as we see in these uh, in, in these documents. And since that is true, they do owe it to the people, the members of the church, especially the ones who have children going to church. To do everything in their power to uh, prevent this from you're never going to be able to prevent it 100 percent. But the way things are right now, like you said, um, it, there's very little protections in place. Now, there, there's a couple of things, if you don't mind, I'd like to say sort of a, a, in, in my sort of uh, uh, soapbox that I have a, as the founder of Mormon Leaks and, and sort yeah. of being uh, on the front lines of this battle for transparency. I, I think there is a key, th some key things. Some people have asked me. Well, you know, what, 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 is, what do you expect them to do, right? And, and I think there, there's probably hundreds of things we could talk about that they could do. Um, but there's a couple of, of really key things that I think they could do on the short term that would have a huge impact on this. Um, you know, first of all, uh, related to bishops' interviews, they can easily implement a no-tolerance policy that no bishop under any circumstance meets with a, a, a minor under the age of 18 without... Uh, another adult or probably even a parent present. Yeah. Um, but at a, oh, yeah. at a minimum, another adult. Um, another, uh, that's an easy one, right? But there's two things that I think they could do tomorrow that, that, uh, that would go a long way to start. It's not going to solve the problem, but it'll start us down the road. Publish the number of incidences of sexual abuse that are happening every year. And, Publish the amount of money that's paid out in settlements every year. This, <laughs> yeah. We don't need this. We don't need the details. Like we don't I need to know that will never happen. That that, well, that simply but, will never happen. It, but it sh that shouldn't be the case because I'm not saying that if Bishop Smith has been accused and we don't have absolute proof, but the church was founded in their best interest to settle the case, even though maybe the case was not proved in a court of law. I'm not suggesting that that Bishop Smith. Name should be thrown out there, okay? Because maybe at the end of the day, we don't actually know what happened. But the the accusation should be tallied in a in a report as, hey, there was one accusation uh, in this month in Utah or whatever, and X number of dollars were paid out, um, and you know, just totals, an aggregate total of every year, and and this kind of thing gets the conversation started, and maybe people will realize I've talked to so many people, including um, Deb, who compiled this list. She told me that one of her motivations was um, that when she her family was affected by sexual abuse um, pr prior to that, she did not think there was sex abuse within the church. And she thought that, oh, uh, she thought that the case she thought okay. that the case that affected her family was an isolated incident. And she soon found out that that was not true. And that yeah, was what obviously. was the huge motivation that be, made her an activist, an advocate, and ultimately the compiler of this of this list. And the, unfortunately, a lot of times we hear 
about sex abuse within Mormon church at a, at, at an arm's length distance or even farther. We hear about a little news clip in Deseret News or in the Salt Lake Tribune, and it's a little blip on the radar that fades away. And it's hard to sort of connect the dots between the various different cases. Um, and we don't realize that this stuff is going on as much as it's going on. Um, you know, and so, the, the, like what you're talking about, Ryan, the, the problem is, is it requires the church to be proactive in transparency, which they are not going to do. They are only reactive in opening up their yeah. books, especially when it comes to money. But um, having a program, a system implemented that tracks people's records, and when one of these allegations comes up, that goes on to their, you know, church permanent record, and that when a bishop goes to punch this person's name to fill them into a leadership position that handles children, it should come up with a little dialogue box that says, error, this person can't be assigned because they've been accused of abusing children this and this and this time, like – there should be that red flag. That red flag should come up all the time when this happens. And it shouldn't just be the church leaders who see that red flag. It should also be the parents of somebody yeah. who might be living next door to this person. That's why we have a child sex offender registry. There shouldn't be a separate registry that exists only internally inside the church. It should be open and transparent for everybody to see. That is the primary problem, and what we're talking about right now is a system that they will never commit to because it requires them to be transparent. It, this is this is a system that needs to be legislated into action. I'm going to keep pounding the drum, even though I know I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. Um, that they, they they probably will not uh, do any of this voluntarily. But until until they do, I'm going to keep saying that there's no reason why the members don't have a right to know how much of their tithing dollars are being uh, spent on on settlements. And here's another thing that would go a long way that will probably fall in the category of something you'll say the church will never do. But, but here's the message the church needs to send to every sex offender and potential sex offender out there. I want that message to be we will do, we as an institution will do everything in our power that that the full punishment of the law comes down upon you. And I realize there might be some limitations in that because maybe there's a victim that won't testify or maybe the proof is not strong enough. But we as a church will do everything in our power to make sure that you are held accountable for your crimes and, and let people know that they will make their lives a living hell. But, but that policy, Ryan, I'm sorry, that policy, just making that saying that that's a policy is weak. That is complete weak sauce when it comes down to implementing, because the problem is when somebody is, uh, you know, a primary leader or somebody is, uh, you know, a scout leader and they abuse a child, they go to their friend who is their neighbor, who is their bishop. And they say, hey, something may have happened. This is what happened. You know, I'm very sorry. I repent for it. Oh, you know what? Don't do it again. You're obviously very sorry about what you did we'll bring the the you know the parents in or the child in and we'll discuss it with them and we'll keep everybody on the up and up and you will not be able to take the sacrament for this long and you'll get a little red mark on your record of something that happened or maybe not even that and then it goes away it's gone that problem is gone forever right. And that person may move to a new place where they are – they're able to get out from underneath that little red asterisk that is on their record. The problem is it should always be a legal policy that all church leaders are mandatory reporters. When something like this comes up, it should be a law that they have to go to the police first. And unfortunately, that is something that needs to be legislated that the church will never proactively do. No church will proactively do that because this is a systematic problem with a number of churches. It's not just the Catholics and the Mormons. Yeah. Well, some some churches do, but you're right. It lacks. Now, the Community of Christ, uh, I've looked into this. You know, they're the bi you know the biggest offshoot from the Mormon Church. Um, it's based on what I've read about them. They actually have as a policy to be mandatory reporters no matter what. And, and also, they, <laughs> they also have women in leadership positions. Once yeah. that's incorporated, a lot of these yeah. problems solve themselves as well. Yep. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, look, there's so much there. The, the problem with offering suggestions on what for them for them to do is there's so much that they're not doing that <laughs> in order for them to change, it would have to be this whole huge paradigm shift. And uh, you're right. Unfortunately, it's never going to happen. So hopefully documents like this will, uh, you know, sort of an, in an underground way, make people more aware 
even though you know these Mormons might hate my website, hopefully they hear about this document and they at least say, okay, you know, maybe I need to keep my eyes a little bit more open, my ears a little bit more open than I was before, and 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 baby steps, I guess. That's all I can yeah. really say. And do not let your kid meet with your bishop without you present. Just do not. Yep. That is on the parents responsibility to make sure that your your son or daughter is never in a closed room with another man alone like just don't don't let that happen don't don't let it happen obviously until there are actual legal systems in place that protect these children it's incumbent on or it's up to the parents to protect their own children now they can't always do that and the kids that slip through the cracks are obviously the kids who you know suffer these issues but like Protect your kids with every ounce of pos- every ounce of your effort that you possibly can, because the church sure as hell is not going to do it for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. That was a really harsh <laughs> note to end this, Ryan. This is this has been a very enlightening Mormon leaks minute, man. This is a. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm I'm really really glad to see this you know this 316 page document out there, and I'm really really pleased to see these these Denver snuffer documents out there because I think it just goes to show that the church doesn't exactly well that I think they're get, getting caught flat footed more often than they would like to be. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, we've got a lot more great stuff to come leading up to conference. I think we've got some great leaks. Um, and, uh, I, I don't mean that to be any sort of hype. We don't have anything that's going to burn the church down like some people want, but, but I think we've got some leaks coming up that are going to be foster some, uh, some more great, uh, Mormon leaks minutes episodes. So awesome. I think we all look forward to that, Ryan. It's always a pleasure to have you on. And every time I come on, you come on here, we both soapbox about things that we're pissed <laughs> off about. And, uh, you know, here we are, uh, you know, nearly 35 minutes later, still talking about this stuff, but Ryan, <laughs> once again, man, thanks for coming on. We'll have you back on in a couple of weeks to talk more about Mormon leaks. Yeah, no problem. Anytime. That'll pretty much do it for us for today. I do want to just make a quick comment in wrapping up the discussion that Ryan and I had. I don't think that this entire document, uh, the 316-page document, received enough press. And I don't think that the church understands how great of a problem child sex abuse poses to the church. It's a much bigger problem than Denver Snuffer ever will be. You know, a few hundred people might read Snuffer's books and say, oh, I like this. The current church is in apostasy, whatever. The church handles that through excommunication. But those problems are like getting a little dirt on their arm, right? They brush the dirt off. You're good. No problem. But child sex abuse inside the church is a cancer. And it will only further metastasize until measures are taken to cut it out and to have preventative care to see that it doesn't become even greater of a problem than it already is. I don't know what the best option is. I don't know the solution to this. And I consider myself lucky that I don't run a multi-billion dollar corporation with millions of followers. You know, pedophiles are inevitably going to squeak into organizations this way. I don't have to deal with that as a very very small business, small organization, but the church does. That is just a simple fact of what they have in their population statistics. Pedophiles and child predators will exist and they need measures to stop them from being able to take advantage of the system. They need to be able to recognize when something like this is happening and be able to remove a person who is a problem instead of just forgiving them and putting them in another calling or forgiving them and ignoring it or never dealing with the problem in the first place. I think that legislating against this is probably one of the only ways to force the LDS church as well as the Catholic church and any other church to take care of this or to even slightly mitigate this problem. If they were all, if all ministers were classified as mandatory reporters Maybe things would change a little bit. Maybe if there were more women, you know, Ryan and I kind of hit on this a little bit. If there were more women in leadership roles in the church, I think that these problems would uh, largely become uh, more 
understood, more recognized by the communities, the local communities that are engaging in these, and children would be more protected. And there would be less men that are child sex predators in leadership positions in order to perpetrate their crimes. My point is the church has a massive problem with this. They have to fix it. And it's not just, it's not just the Catholic church that has, you know, an underground sex ring or whatever of these child raping priests. It's every church that has a problem at some level. Whether they are connected to it or it's, you know, just members of their, their you know, parishioners, whatever the case may be, nearly every church out there has to deal with this topic somehow. And the problem is it's such a taboo topic and it's not in the public eye enough that nobody is talking about the right solutions to this and to fix all solutions. You know, not just a band-aid over the problem that's, you know, oh, well, we set up a child sex abuse hotline that goes straight up to the apostles. No, no, no. That's not good enough. There needs to be law enforcement included in this. There needs to be a legal protection in place somewhere in the equation to deal with these problems. Because as the, this report cited, the vast, vast majority of sexual predators do not ever get arrested or they're never uh, prosecuted. And, uh, you know, for some of the extraneous cases, they can, you know, these these predators can have their way with hundreds of children before anything ever happens or before what they, they die off. And then allegations come out after their death that something was happening. I mean, this is a massive issue. And I don't think that it's been enough of a topic of discussion. If you go to the Facebook page, You'll see a post that's just this, separate from this episode's post that's uh, just talking about this, this child sex abuse. And I want to start a bit of a discussion there. Hopefully we can get some people engaged in this because this is something that it did receive a little bit of press when it came out. But, you know, Ryan didn't feature it as the primary document, the primary leak, because it wasn't a leak. And I think his reasoning behind that is sound. I, I understand why. But even the ex-Mormon Reddit, subreddit, didn't pick this story up and run with it very long. It disappeared after a day or two. The 2X chromosomes uh, subreddit had quite a few uh, you know, comments about it, and it went away pretty soon after that. Uh, you know, a day or two after the post was there, it disappeared. And that's a, a bit of an issue with our, you know, kind of our overflow of knowledge is these important stories tend to get buried by the newest stories. But I don't want this to get buried. I think this needs to come into the public eye much more. So that's those are just kind of my concluding thoughts. Um, as if Ryan and I didn't soapbox enough during the segment, I had to jump right back on that soapbox and shout a little bit more. So, oh, well, there we go. All right. One thing to uh, to make everybody aware of, I don't know why this happened. I blame it to the the energies in the universe due to the eclipse. But last week I posted the episode and I I went off the grid for a few days uh, to go witness the eclipse. And I came back and I realized that the last episode, episode 63, it was posted, but it didn't get picked up by a bunch of aggregators. So I, I had to go through some troubleshooting and technical difficulties. Needless to say, episode 63 is up as of yesterday. It is online, ready to go, ready to be listened to. I hope that uh, nobody was too perturbed about that episode just not showing up on Thursdays when we usually release. But there's that episode. And then, of course, episode 64 this week, it's going up tonight. So yeah, apologies for any inconvenience that may have created. So with that clarified and taken care of, uh, there was one new patron to thank. We have Marissa Alexa McCool of the McCool, sorry, Riss McCool uh, Publishing Everything, tons of podcasts, uh, inciting incident, the sister getting out of hand. She does a bunch of really cool work online and has a, a massive online presence. So Marissa McCool, thank you so much for supporting to pledge the show at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. And gaining access to all of the exclusive content and exclusive Patreon-only episodes like the <laughs> frackin' bad movies that Marie and I just did. Uh, just want to plug that again to let everybody know. If you are supporters of Patreon on my show or on my Book of Mormon, you do gain access to that episode. And we plan on doing <laughs> quite a few more of those. They're really, 
really fun to do and they take less prep work than this show does. So we can turn them out, you know, once a month at least. So with that, I think we are all set for today. I do want to say supporters on Patreon, they, they keep the show going, but it's much, much more than that. Okay. When you support at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism, what you're doing is adding your voice to the people who are pissed off at the church for doing what they do. For whether it's covering up child sex abuse, whether it's ignoring historical problems, whether it's creating a brainwashing cult mentality in the minds of their followers, whether it's the shunning that happens when people leave the church, no matter what it is that ticks you off about the church, when you contribute, you are adding your voice to a growing body of people who are saying, we are not okay with this anymore. We don't want the church to continue to have control over our lives. If you want evidence for the impact that secular Mormonism is having or, well, <laughs> disaffection from the church is having, I did recently see this number. I wasn't able to verify it beyond just the post that I saw it, but the church has apparently, according to this post, closed 272 wards in North America alone just in 2016. Churches don't close wards unless they are downsizing, and they are downsizing because they don't have the the sustainability. People are leaving in droves. This movement is growing. This secular Mormonism is growing. This fuck the church movement is growing. And the church can only diminish. They have an inverse relationship to each other. So if you are just as happy as I am about this inverse relationship and the diminishing of the church's numbers as I am, Join in support and saying secular Mormonism will win out. And if you want to support the cause of breaking the church and causing it to consider itself critically, then please consider joining the fight at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism, where you can sign up to support for as little as a penny an episode. That's not very much, but, um, you know, a dollar an episode, that's like a coffee a month um, or a gallon of gas per month pretty much. So anyway, uh, thank you to those who do support. And uh, I hope that we can all consider ourselves part of the secular uh, Mormonism NAMO family. And uh, I, I definitely do give out my warmest gratitude and appreciation to those who do pledge to support. That being said, uh, sales pitch over. Let's thank a few people for keeping the show going in the back end. First off, I need to thank Julie for publishing up on the Facebook and Twitter feeds where she keeps the conversation going there. Also, I need to thank Jason Camo. He provided the music that's used in the show with his permission. He is the owner of alaststateofmind.com where you can download all of his music there. The artwork provided in the show is done by Craig Keeling of weirdmormonshit.com. Be sure to check out that blog for lots of weird Mormon shit. Legal counsel for this podcast is provided by Andrew Torres of the Law Offices of P. Andrew Torres. Be sure to check out opening arguments to hear him and Thomas talk about some uh, eh, some secular law topics. Also, huge congratulations out to friend of the show, Thomas Smith. Just became a father, and it sounds like uh, everything in his world is chaos, but exciting at the same time. So congratulations to Thomas. With that, thank you so much once again to the patrons, but most importantly... Thank you to all of you who make this secular Mormonism an actual movement by downloading every week. Once again, for lending me your ear. Hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.
preceding podcast is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC. Copyright 2017. All rights reserved.